And then, dear brothers and sisters in Christ, grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. So we have two very important openings in Scripture, the first one being the one that we read this morning from Genesis chapter 1. But there's another really important opening found in John chapter 1. And it both, they both begin in the beginning. And in the beginning is God. I particularly like the, the John lesson because of the way that uh, John describes it. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. As we read more in John chapter 1, we see that this Word takes on human flesh and dwells amongst us, moves into the neighborhood with us, hangs out with us, lives among us, however you'd like to phrase it. Here we have God in the flesh with us. We read further that this is none other than Jesus Christ, and he himself proclaims that he is the Son of God. We read at his baptism that God, the Father, opens up the heavens and declares that this is the Son. But Genesis is also very important because what do we hear hovering over the waters but the very Spirit of God? We also hear of this Spirit elsewhere in Scripture as being the helper who is sent by the Father and by the Son for the purpose of helping. I hope that's obvious. But also as we look not only this week but also last week at Pentecost, this is the one who, as Nancy well said, plants the seed of faith in so many hearts. I think one of the, the great ways to also see this is uh, in 1 Corinthians 6 where Paul describes us as temples of the Holy Spirit. We ourselves in our bodies are then brought into God as well. What we see when we look through Scripture is that we have a very unique God that has made himself known to us. He's not far off. He's not distant. He is intimately connected with who we are. What I also think is rather interesting, though, is that we don't really get a physical description of God. We hear that Jesus is a man, we hear that the Spirit takes the form of a dove, but that's really it. Did Jesus look like a, a white guy with long hair? Maybe, maybe not. There's a, if you remember a couple of years ago, there was a, the History Channel did some, some sleuthing and figured out that Jesus uh, would, would have been, well, an Arabic-looking man with very short hair, dark skin. What did he actually look like is actually not important as far as Scripture defines him. What Scripture does is it defines God by his works, by his actions, and, into, and especially that he is unlike anything else in all of creation. He, in fact, is above all of creation. And while this is really difficult for our heads to wrap around, we have this, this old image of the apple with its three parts, but that even doesn't convey it. And the reason is, is because there is nothing like God. And that's not a statement of glory. Like, literally, there is nothing like God. He is so, so unique. There, there is nothing that exists like him. And, and you might be familiar with it. We have that, uh, that teaching that's the triangle. Well, we kind of have one here where this is kind of the old style teaching with the, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The Father is God. The Son is God. The Holy Spirit is God. But the Father is not the Son nor the Spirit. The Son is not the Father nor the Spirit. And the Spirit is not the Father nor the Son. It's weird. Let's be honest. And it's weird to us because... There's nothing that exists like God. But again, the best way to understand God is to see how he works. We begin our Lord's Prayer with our Father who art in heaven. This is what we are taught to pray by Jesus, that we acknowledge the Father. In pictures, we usually have him depicted as, as an old man with a big long beard. I assume that that's kind of to de depict how, how long he's been around. He's an old guy. But the scripture doesn't define him like that. Scriptures define him as a loving father, right? He is a loving father who is also stern, knowing when to correct his children. 
He is one who provides everything, but also he teaches his people how to support themselves. He disciplines, not out of hatred or malice or anything like that, but to grow people. He is also the one who is tasked with bringing order to all things. When we hear of Jesus saying, you know, giving the answer to the question, when is the end going to come? Jesus himself says, only the Father knows that. He is the one who brings the order of it all. But also we regard the Father as being in charge of creation. And while we do see all three members there at the, uh, at the beginning in uh, Genesis chapter 1, what we really regard the Father in charge of with creation is that he is constantly providing for it, constantly caring for it, continually sustaining his creation. And then we also look at the Son, who is here because this creation that the Father provided is suffering. And it is suffering due to the consequences of sin. This is where Jesus steps in. At the time of his conception, he takes human form. Question is, did he always have this form? Did he always look like this? We just don't know. Scriptures don't think that that's very important. They, again, focus on his work. Christ has been tasked with taking on humanity's sin. Where we have been imperfect, he is perfect. Where we were broken, he made us whole. And most important, where sin and death reigned, he brought his rule and his reign and his power. And he accomplished this by dying on the cross and rising from the grave and ascending into heaven and promising his return to make all things new, while also promising to remain with us. And then we see the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit who, again, we don't know what he looks like. Sometimes takes the form of a dove, hence that's why it's his symbol. But we don't know what he really looks like. And I keep saying he. You know, genderless, really. The Spirit is the Spirit. Last week we looked at Pentecost and we saw the the outpouring of God's Holy Spirit onto his people in Jerusalem so that they could proclaim his works to to all the people who are gathered in Jerusalem. Here we hear that again in Acts chapter 2 today where Peter gives his Pentecost sermon talking about the Christ. The Spirit's work is to powerfully move us to be a part of God's work. The Spirit is the one who plants the seed of faith, who, br- who brings us to God, who makes God known to us through God's word, but also then powerfully works through us to continue that action. Because I doubt if any of us saw a spirit or a dove descending on us to bring us faith. But the Spirit was at work in the hearts and lives of our loved ones, our friends, our families, maybe even some pastors who through the Spirit then proclaim to you the power of God. There's an awesome way to understand this. I think some of you are familiar that in my Bible study I was doing uh, the Bible Project. The Bible Project is a series of videos where they explain books of the Bible as well as other things. And their one on Pentecost, in the book of Acts, their, their focus on Pentecost was focusing on the transition of the Spirit of God. Because in the Old Testament times, we had the temple. And inside the temple, we had the most holy place. A place so holy that if you were unworthy, you were struck dead. If you entered into that place. At the time of Jesus' death and resurrection, well, at his death, what happens? The veil of the temple is torn. The thing separating the most holy place is now removed. Does that mean death for us? No, actually. Rather, we see the power of God's Spirit move out of that place and then dwell in the hearts of people. So now, no longer is God dwelling in temples made by human hands, but in humanity, as Paul reminds us in 1 Corinthians. And as the Spirit of God dwells in us, he leads us, guides us, helps us, grows us, brings us to know God deeper and more. But the question always is, So what? Why do we care? Why is this an important thing to know? 
Why is this so important to the people of this church that we have taken it on as our name? Why is this such an important thing that we have a Sunday dedicated to celebrating it? And it's not necessarily important that it, it changes things for us because, honestly, God is God. We are not. God's going to do what God is going to do, whether we understand him fully or whether we don't understand him at all. But what I think is important to see about the Trinity is to see how God has shown himself to us. Again, God is not removed from us. He is not distant. He is not far away. He is intimately connected with us. He knows what it feels like. He knows what life is because, well, he made it, but he knows what it's like to live life in, in, in stressful places and stressful times because he himself went through it. He himself continues to go through it as we go through it. He is closely connected to his creation. And we get to see how God exists by how he serves us. He shows us who he truly is. That he is the Trinity. We not only see this unique nature of God, but this unique personality. There's no one like him. He is merciful. He is kind. He is loving. He wants what's best for his creation. He wants all people to know him so that he can bless them more. He's not lazy. He's proactive. He is above all things good and evil as all things work according to his purposes. And I think that this shows most profoundly in the death and resurrection of Jesus. The crucifixion is an evil thing. Very brutal killing. It's evil. Death is evil. It is a terrible thing that not only does it remove life, but it breaks the hearts of everyone around. But yet God works his purposes even in something evil like that. And this is truly who our God is as he shows himself to us that the Father is willing to save his creation by giving of his only beloved Son. And that this Son loves and adores his Father and this creation so that he gives of himself to relieve us from this burden of sin and death, to give us everlasting life. We see just how important this is as the Spirit continually moves and works and fights that God would be made known so that all might have eternal life. God's desire is not that people would die. God's desire is that his creation would live, that it would return to that very good state. This is where we place our hope. So many out there in our world question who is God. A bunch of people think of themselves as God. Uh, many people find God out in nature or they find God in idols. However they want to define it, many people define it in many different ways. But who God truly is, is revealed to us through the death and resurrection of Jesus. Because here we see a God who is willing to do whatever it takes for his world. We see a God who gives the Son. A God who suffers. A God who proclaims victory so that all people would have life. When people question who is God, we can point them to the God that is the three in one, the one in three who shows us who he truly is, not by telling us what he looks like, but by loving us, showing us his actions, suffering for us, rising for us, and promising perfection to us. Amen? Amen. Amen.